are together again by Enid Blyton. George and her three cousins, Julian, Dick and Anne, were coming back by train to Kirin for the school holidays. Her thoughts were full of very little else but her beloved dog, Timmy, all the way home. Julian thought how much she looked like a restless boy then, with her short, curly hair and her determined expression. George had always longed to be a boy, but as she wasn't, she made up for it by trying to speak and act like one and would never answer to her full name of Georgina. The train pulled into Kirin station, and the four children set off for Kirin Cottage, where George's parents lived. But when they arrived, they discovered they were not allowed in, because Joanna the cook had scarlet fever. Listen, dears, we're waiting for an ambulance to take Joanna to hospital and... Aunt Fanny, don't worry. We'll all turn to and help. <laughs> Dear Julian, you still don't understand. You see, neither your uncle nor I have had scarlet fever, so we're in quarantine, and we mustn't have anyone near us in case we get it and give it to them. And that might mean we'd give it to all you four. Would Timmy get it? No, of course not. Don't be silly, George. Timmy isn't in quarantine. You can get him out of his kennel as soon as you like. Oh, good. I'll get him now. But Aunt Fanny, what do you want us to do? We can't go to my home because Mummy and Daddy are still in Germany. Should we go to a hotel? No, it's all right, dears. I've been able to arrange something for you. I've been telephoning the scientist who your father has been working with, George, Professor Hayling. Well, he was coming here for a day or two, and when I told him he couldn't because we're in quarantine, he at once said, you must all go there and that Tinker, his son, you remember him, don't you, would be delighted to have your company. Tinker, yes. I shall never forget him, or his monkey either. We had a marvellous time when we went to stay with him before. The bus from here will take you almost to Big Hollow, where Professor Hayling lives. You're to go today. Oh, I'm so sorry about this, dears, but it's just one of those things we have to put up with. I'm sure you'll have a good time with Tinker and that monkey of his. What was it called now? Mischief. Mischief. Mischief, that's right. Well, the bus will pass in ten minutes. Have a good time, dears, and send me a card or two. They all went to the front gate, where the luggage still stood. But it wasn't long before the bus came along. Away it went, bumping over the road from Kirin to Big Hollow. The four children gazed out of the windows as they passed alongside the shore, where the sea shone as blue as cornflowers, and they saw Kirin Island out in the big bay. Wish we were going there. We'll have to take a picnic meal there sometime. I'd like old Tinker to visit my island. Yes, he'll love Kirin Island. Islands are quite different from anything else. Yes, they are. I'd like one too. And I'd like a little cave to sleep in. Just big enough for me. You'd be lonely, Anne. You love to have people around you. You like to be friendly. So does Timmy. Don't you, boy? <laughs> <laughs> the bus dropped them off close to Big Hollow, and the four children and Timmy went through the big heavy gate, which groaned loudly. Timmy trotted at George's heel as they all went down the steep drive to the house. I expect Professor Hayling is afraid of people peering at his work. It's very, very secret, isn't it? I know he uses miles and miles of figures. Tinker told me one day that his monkey mischief once chewed up a page of figures when he was very small. And Professor Hayling chased him for a whole hour. And there he is! Mischief! mischief. You've come to welcome us. Oh, isn't he pleased to see us again? Mischief, where's Tinker? What are you doing here? Clear out! This is private land. I'll fetch the police. Clear out! Oh, gosh! What? Oh, Professor Hayling. Pardon? Professor Hayling, good afternoon. I hope we didn't disturb you, but you did tell my aunt we could come here. Your aunt? Who's your aunt? I don't know any aunt. You're sightseers, that's what you are. You're the third lot today. Clear out, I tell you. And take that dog, too. How dare you? But don't you really know us? You came to stay at our house, you know, and... Stop and nonsense. I haven't been away for years. Dad, don't yell at our friends like that. 
You asked them here yourself. You know you did. I did not. Who are they? Well, George, that girl is the daughter of Mr. Kieran, and the others are his niece and nephews. Uh. And that's their dog, Timmy. You asked them all here because Mr. and Mrs. Kieran are in quarantine with scarlet fever. I don't remember asking them. I would have told Jenny the housekeeper if I had. You did tell her. She's angry because you left breakfast, and now it's almost dinner time. She's cleared it away. Bless me. So that's why I feel so hungry and cross. <laughs> it was just a misunderstanding. It was very, very kind of you to invite us here when we can't be at home because of the scarlet fever. We'll try not to be a nuisance, and if there's anything we can do to help you, please ask us. We'll make as little noise as possible and keep out of your way, of course. Uh, you hear that, Tinker? Why can't you do the same? Make very little noise and keep out of my way. You know, I'm very busy now on a most important project. You... What was your name again? It's Julian. Well, uh, whatever your name is, you'll be welcome if you keep Tinker out of my way. And nobody, absolutely nobody, is to go up into my tower, do you understand? None of us would dream of prying. It's very kind of you to offer to have us here. And do believe me when I say we shan't be any trouble at all. Ah, uh, you sound like a sensible fellow. Well, I'll say goodbye for now and go and have my breakfast. Oh, I hope it's fried eggs and bacon. I'm very hungry. Dad? Jenny's cleared your breakfast away. I told you that before. It's almost dinner time now. Yeah. Jenny certainly had a good dinner for them all. There was a large and delicious stew with carrots, onions and peas and plenty of potatoes. Everyone tucked in well and Mischief, who loved the peas, took quite a few from Tinker's plate. After dinner, the children helped to clear away and Jenny was very pleased with their help. Now, children, I'll show you your bedrooms after we've cleared up. Oh, but you know, Tinker, those mattresses we sent to be remade haven't come back yet. So why don't you take the tents and camp out in the field? Oh, but that monkey's got to go with you. Then perhaps he won't jump in at the workroom window and fiddle about with the professor's models. Now, Tinker, why don't you take Anne to see where to put up the tents? So down the garden went Tinker and Anne and out through the gate at the bottom into a big field. There were four caravans trundling in the far gate, and behind them in the lane were vans, enormous vans, all with large words painted on them. Tapper's Travelling Circus. Tinker walked over to the first van and addressed the man there. He was rather fierce-looking and had a long bushy beard, enormous eyebrows and only one ear. He looked inquiringly at Tinker, and put out his hand for mischief. My monkey might bite you. He doesn't like strangers. Uh, I'm no stranger to any monkey. There isn't a monkey in the world, not a chimp that wouldn't come to me if I called it. There you are. <laughs> He's a nice little fellow he is. Now, what is it you wanted to say to me? I'd come to say that this field belongs to my father, Professor Hailing, and you've no right to bring your caravans here, so please take them all out. My friends and I are planning to camp out here. Well, I've no objection to that. You choose your own corner, young man. If you don't interfere with us, we shan't interfere with you. Is he selling you that monkey, Grandad? No, I'm not. I came to tell you and your caravans to clear out. This field belongs to my family. Ah, but we've an old license to come here every ten years. And believe it or not, there's been a tapper's circus in this field every ten years since the year 1648. So you just run home and make no silly fuss, young man. You're a fibber. I'll tell the police. I'll tell my father. I'll... Don't you talk to my granddad like that. I'll hit you if you do. I'll say what I like and just you shut up. <laughs> Ow! I'll get you. No, no, don't you be silly, boy. Jeremy here is a tapper like me and he'll never give in. Now you go home and be sensible. We are not going to take notice of a hot-headed kid like you. Our circus is coming in this field, just like it has for years and years. Tinker turned and ran back to the gate. He wondered what to do. He had so often heard his father say that the field behind their house belonged to him. How dare the travelling circus come into it? He went into the house, followed by a puzzled Anne. He looked into the sitting room and saw George there. Tinker, that boy knocked you down. Why did he do that? Oh, just because I told his granddad to take his caravans away. He didn't hurt me at all, just punched me on the chest. Still, I'd said what I'd gone to say. But will they take the caravans away out of the field? I told them I'd tell the police, so they'd better go. They haven't any right to be there. It's our field. Are you going to the police? 
I really don't see why you have to make such a fuss about it all, Tinker. They might make it difficult for us to go camping there. But I tell you, it's my field. Dad always said so. He said it wasn't any use to him, so I could consider it my own. And I do. And we're going to camp there, whatever anybody says. It's a travelling circus that's coming there. The old man said. Oh, Tinker, how marvellous to have a circus at the bottom of the garden. Just like girls to say a thing like that. Would you want people trespassing all over the field that belong to you, with horses neighing, tigers and lions roaring, bears grunting, chimpanzees stealing things, and a nasty circus boy being rude to you all the time, ready to knock you down? Oh, Tinker, you do make it sound so exciting. Will there really be lions and tigers? Suppose one escaped. What a thrill. Well, I shouldn't like it. Neither do I. That's why I'm going to tell Dad about it. He's got the old document that sets the rights out to that field. I'll ask him about it, and if he'll let me see it, I'll take it straight to the police and let them turn out that rude old man in his circus. But when his father got out the old document, there was a shock in store for Tinker. The two girls and Tinker waited while the professor pored over the old and beautiful lettering. He jabbed his finger at three lines towards the end. Uh, yes, there, there it is. I'll quote it. Listen. And let it be known that ye travelling show, so named Tapper's travelling show, which has always had camping rights, shall still have the right to claim these once every ten years, so long as the show travels the country ways, given under my hand, and so on and so on. You might have told me that before, Dad. Why? What possible interest can it have for you children? Only that there's a circus called Tapper's Travelling Circus in that field at this very minute. And the old man with it is called Tapper. And he said it was his right to be there. And He was rude to me. And I want you to turn this circus out this very day. I'm sure Mr. Tapper would have no objections to you camping there. Aren't you being rather silly, Tinker? You weren't rude to any of the circus folk, were you? Well, were you? Huh. And if you and the others want to camp in the field, I'll go and speak to this Mr. Tapper. Oh, uh, no, it's all right. He's already said that it didn't matter if we camped there. Dick and Julian were most interested to hear about the travelling circus and the old document. You made a bit of a fool of yourself there, Tinker. Still, there's no harm done, apparently. I vote we go and see where we can put up our tents. Personally, I shall be thrilled to see a bit of circus life so close to me. What about putting up our tents after tea? It's hotter than ever today. I just want to laze. You feel the same, old chap, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> he says he's not at all tired. He wants a walk. Well, if he's not tired, I am. No, Timmy, I'm not going to take you for a walk. <laughs> oh, look. Mischief is cuddling Timmy to comfort him. What now? Have you heard something, Timmy? It's music of some kind. Oh, I believe I know what it is. What? It must be Tapper's Travelling Circus Band, practising for opening night. Yes, it does sound like a band. Maybe we'll see it when we put up our tents. Well, if Mr Tapper isn't annoyed about Tinker trying to turn them out, he might let us wander around. That's settled then, is it? We go down with our things after tea and see if we can put up our tents in some sheltered corner. Great! Yes. Between them, the children lugged all the things down to the garden. Tents, ground sheets, blankets, tent pegs, and all the rest. Timmy ran with them in excitement, wondering what all the fuss was about. Mischief, of course, leapt to the top of whatever was being carried and chattered excitedly all the way down the garden. He got into trouble when he ran off with a tent peg, but Timmy managed to catch him and make him drop it. Then, very solemnly, Timmy carried the tent peg to Julian. Timmy, just keep an eye on that wicked little monkey, will you? There are all sorts of things he might run off with. They'd make a good pair for the circus. I'd bet Mischief would hold on to the reins, if Timmy had any. Well, he's not going to have any. Phew! What a lot of things we've got. Is that the lot? Yes, I think so. They've certainly got some large vans to the circus, haven't they? And what bright colours! And all those caravans there are for the circus folk to live in, I suppose. Oh, how nice it must be to live in one, instead of in a home that doesn't go anywhere. Look at those horses coming out of that horse box. Aren't they lovely? 
There's the boy who knocked Tinker down with them. Oh. Well, let's take the camp things into the field anyway. The nearer we are to the circus, the better. We ought to have some fun. Dick and I will climb over the fence and you hand the stuff over. It was quite a job getting everything over, but at last it was all safely there, lying on the grass. Then Julian, Anne and George climbed over the fence to join Dick and Tinker and stood in the field looking round for a good corner to set up their tents. What about near those bushes over there? There's a big tree to protect us from the wind and we aren't too near the circus folk. Oh, it's going to be fun. I think I'd better go and find the old granddad, Mr Tapper, just to tell him we're here, in case he thinks we're intruders and have no right to be here. You haven't got to ask for his permission to be in my field. Now don't keep flying off the handle like that, Tinker. This is merely a question of good manners. All right, all right. But it is my field after all. You'll be telling me to be friends with that nasty circus boy next. Well, you better be, else he might knock you flat again. Anyway, be sensible, Tinker. It's not often people have a circus just at the bottom of their garden and can pop over the fence and mix with the circus folk. Julian walked over to the nearest caravan. It was empty, but a small girl came running up and told him where they could find Mr Tapper. He was looking at a beautiful chestnut brown horse tethered close to him. He had one of the horse's hooves in his hand. Mr. Tapper looked round when he heard the children approaching, his eyes very bright under his black eyebrows. He set the horse's hoof down and gave the lovely creature a pat. There. You don't need to limp any more, my beauty. I've taken out that stone that was in your hoof. You can dance again now. Does that horse really dance? Dance? It's one of the finest dancing horses in the world. <whistles> oh, the lovely thing. Do all your horses dance as well as this one? Yes, some a good deal better. This one has a fair ear for music, but not as good an ear as some. You wait till you see them dressed up with feathery plumes nodding on their heads. Horses, there's nothing in the world as beautiful as a good horse. Mr. Tapper, we come from the house over the fence there. As you probably know, Tinker's father owns this field. Yes, yes, but we have an old right to come here every so often. Now, don't you start arguing... I haven't come to argue with you. I've only just come to say that we, that is, my friends here and I, would like to come and camp in this field. But we shouldn't annoy you in any way. And Oh, well, if that's what you want, you're more than welcome. More than welcome. I thought maybe you'd think you could turn us out like that youngster there would like to do. <laughs> My grandson didn't think much of that idea, did he, youngster? He hit out, and down you went on your back. He's got a temper, he has, young Jeremy. But another time, maybe, he'll find himself on his back, eh? Yes, he will. Right. Well, you'll be even with one another, then. And you can shake hands like gentlemen. Now, what about you bringing your gear right into the field and setting up your tents? I'll get old Charlie the Chimp to help you. He's as strong as ten men. A chimpanzee? Is he tame enough to help us put up our tents? Old Charlie is cleverer than all of you put together. And as tame as you are. And he could beat you three boys at cricket any day. You bring your bat along one morning and watch him. I'll call him to help you. Charlie! Charlie! Where are you? Snoozing, I suppose. Well, you go and fetch him. He's in that cage over there. The, the one with the tarpaulin roof. Let's get him, Ju. Fancy having a chimpanzee to help us. Tinker came to the big cage first. He peered inside. Charlie the chimp was in there, all right, sitting at the back of his cage, his brown eyes looking at the children with curiosity. The chimp made a funny noise that Mischief the monkey immediately tried to imitate. The chimpanzee stared at mischief, then he grew very excited. He rattled his cage, jumped up and down, and made some very odd noises indeed. A boy came running up at once. It was the boy who had knocked Tinker down. Hey, what are you doing to the chimp? Oh, aren't you the boy that shouted at my granddad? The one I knocked down? Yes, and don't you dare try that on again, or you'll be sorry. Shut up, Tinker. Your name's Jeremy, isn't it? Well, I've just been talking to your granddad over there, and he said we could get the chimpanzee to help us with our camping gear. It's all right for him to come out of his cage, isn't it? Oh, yes. I take him out two or three times a day. He gets boards in his cage. He'd love to help put up your tents. He's always helping with things like that. 
He's as strong as a lion. Is he, um... Safe? What do you mean, safe? He's as safe as I am. Charlie, come on out. Go on. You can enter your cage perfectly well. You know you can. See? Easy, isn't it? Charlie boy, come along. Your help's wanted. Charlie lumbered out of his cage and went with the children to where they had left their tents and ground sheets and the rest. He walked with his fists on the ground in a most inelegant manner, making a funny little groaning noise all the time. Mischief was rather afraid of him and kept well to the back. But the chimpanzee suddenly turned round, caught hold of Mischief and sat him up on his shoulder. Mischief held on, not knowing whether to be scared or jubilant. They went over to the pile of camping gear and Julian and Dick began to put up the tents. Charlie watched them with the greatest interest and helped most intelligently when he saw that he could. He's a good sort, isn't he? Did you see him put that tent pole in exactly the right place? He ought to get wages. He does. He gets eight bananas a day and as many oranges as he likes. And he loves sweets. Oh, I think I've got some. There you are. You can't give him those. They're old and sticky and messy. Here, don't snatch Charlie. He'll choke. Not Charlie. Let him be. He'll go straight back to his cage, get in, shoot the bolts and sit there sucking sweets till they're gone. He'll be as happy as can be. Well, he certainly deserved a reward. He did all the heavy work. Come on, let's finish putting everything straight. Hey, won't it be fun sleeping in our tents tonight? Though we'd better have supper first. You can come and join us if you like. We don't have posh food like you do, of course. But it's good food all the same. Old Grandma cooks it in her pot. She's 200 years old. <laughs> <laughs> 200? Nobody lives as long as that. That's what she tells everyone. And she looks it too. But her eyes are sharp as needles still. Shall I tell her you'll be here for supper? But would there be enough for so many extra? We meant to bring our own meal. Should we bring that and share everything with you? We've more than enough. Jenny said she would have it all ready for us to bring down tonight. A meat pie, cold sausages and apples and bananas. Shh! Don't say bananas in front of Charlie. He'll worry you for them all the time. All right, you bring your foods and we'll share with you around the campfire. I'll tell old Grandma we're having a sing-song tonight and Fred the Fiddler's playing the fiddle. This all sounded very exciting. Julian thought they ought to go back home before anyone began to be worried about their complete disappearance and pack up the food for supper that night. At last the food was all ready to take down the garden to the field. What a lot there seemed. Well, they would certainly have plenty to spare for their circus friends. They said goodbye to Jenny and set off down the garden again. They thought they'd better not disturb Professor Hailing. As soon as Jeremy saw the visitors climbing over the fence, he ran to help them. Hello, all of you. This will be great fun having guests. Come on over to old Grandad's first. Welcome, welcome. Now, I expect your friends would like to see round a bit, wouldn't they? Oh, yes. Well, young Jeremy, why don't you act as host? Charlie the Chimp can go with you. We've a rehearsal on tonight and the ring has been set up. So, you can watch some of the show. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Ah, it's a pleasure. Pleasure. Now, you all run along and uh, I'll see you later for supper. The children had a great time watching the rehearsal. The musical horses began to troop into the ring, the leading one ridden by Madeline, a lovely girl dressed in shimmering gold. Then in came Fred the Fiddler, a dancing donkey, and more. It was very exciting. Afterwards, Jeremy led the way out of the circus ring. They all went over the field to where a large fire was burning, cleverly set about with stones. An enormous cooking pot was hung over it, and a very, very nice smell came to their noses as they went near. Old Grandma was there, of course, and she began stirring the pot when she saw them. You've been a long time. Supper's ready. It smells good. You help your grandmother then, Jeremy. Yes, Grandad. Shall I help ladle out the stew, Grandma? Yes, here you are. You give your friends some supper. Well, did 
Did you like our little rehearsal, Julian? Oh, yes. I'm only sorry you didn't rehearse all the turns. Why's that? I badly wanted to see the acrobats and the clowns. Are they here? I can't see them. Oh, yes. Uh, look, there's one clown over there. With Madeline, who had the horses. Is he a clown? He doesn't look a bit funny. He looks miserable. <laughs> That's Monty, all right. He always looks like that out of the ring. He'll make you double up with laughter when the circus is on, but uh, a lot of clowns are like Monty when they're not performing. There's another member of your circus we didn't see at the rehearsal, Mr. Tapper. That's Mr. Wu, the wonder magician, isn't it? Why wasn't he there? Oh, he never rehearses. He keeps himself to himself, does Mr. Wu. He may come and join us for supper, and he may not. Yes, we're opening the circus tomorrow night. Maybe he'll turn up tonight. He's not a real wizard, is he? Well, when I talk to Mr. Wu, sometimes I think he is. There isn't a thing he doesn't know about figures. There isn't a thing he can't do with them. Ask him to multiply any number by any other number, and he'll tell you in a second. He shouldn't be in a circus. He should be an inventor of some sort. An inventor whose invention needs pages and pages of figures. He'd be happy then. He sounds a bit like my father. He's an inventor, you know. And sometimes when I creep into his study, I see pages full of millions of tiny figures and plans and diagrams with tiny figures all over them. That's yes, very interesting. Your father and Mr. Wu ought to meet. They would probably talk figures all day long. My word. What's that you're handing round, young lady? Oh, some of the food we brought. Have a sausage or two, Mr. Tapper. And a roll and a tomato. <laughs> well, thanks. It's very kind of you. Nice to meet you all. You might be able to teach Jeremy a few manners. Grandad, here's Mr. Wu. Why, so it is. So, we have visitors this night. May I join you? Oh, do, Mr. Wu. We brought plenty of food. Do you like cold sausage and tomato and a roll? Oh, most delicious. We were disappointed not to see you at the rehearsal. I'd have liked to hear you doing all kinds of wizard sums in your head, as quick as lightning. Like Mr. Tapper said. My father can do that too, you know. He's a wizard at figures as well. He's an inventor. Ah, oh, inventor. And what does he invent? He can invent anything he's asked for. He invented a wonderful thing for keeping aeroplanes dead straight in the right direction. Better than any idea before. He invented the school wheel, if you know what that is. And the electric trozimon, if you've ever heard of that. I don't suppose you have, though. There too. Wait, boy, those things I've heard of, yes. I do not know them, but I certainly have heard of them. Your father must be a very clever man with a most unusual brain. Something got into the papers about his inventions a little while ago, and reporters came down to see Dad, and his name was in the papers. But Dad was awfully cross about it. You see, he's in the middle of the biggest idea he's ever thought of, and it messed up his work to have people coming round to interview him. Some even peered through the window and went to see his wonderful tower with its... Tower? He has a tower? Ah, well, he... Mr. Wu, could you do a bit of magic, reckoning with figures? I've heard you can give answers to any sum as quick as lightning. That is true. There is nothing I cannot do with the figures. Ask me anything you like, and I will give you the answer at once. Well, Mr. Wu, answer this then. Multiply 63,342 by... 80,953. Ha! You can't do that in a hurry. Uh, the answer is in figures of 5,127,724,926. That is an easy question, my boy. Crumbs. That's amazing. Let me give him a sum to do. What do you get if you multiply 602,491 by 352, Mr. Magician? I get the figures of two, one, two, zero, seven, six, eight, three, two. <laughs> but how do you do it so quickly? Magic. Just a little elementary magic. Try it yourself sometime. I'm sure that this boy's father would be as quick as I am. I should very much like to meet your clever father, my boy. We would have much, so much to talk about. I have heard of his wonderful tower, a monument to his genius. Ah, you see, even we foreigners know of your father's great work. Surely he is afraid of having his secrets stolen. 
Oh, I don't think so. The tower's a pretty good hiding place, and... Is that the time already? I'm afraid it's time we were getting back. Oh, really? Must you? Yes, we must. Uh, come on, Tinker. Come on, everybody. Thank you for the supper, Mr Tupper. Will you thank Grandma for us? Yes, yes, of course, but uh, do you have to go so soon? Mr Tapper was most astonished at the sudden departure of his guests. But Julian thought it was time to take Tinker firmly away from Mr Wu and give him a good lecture on keeping his mouth shut. Tinker found himself hustled on all sides and felt a bit scared. Julian sounded rather fierce, he thought. Over the fence they all went, with Julian hustling Tinker in front of him. Once over the fence and out of Mr Wu's hearing, Julian and George rounded on the boy angrily. Are you mad, Tinker? Didn't you guess that that man was trying to pump you about your father's hush-hush job? He wasn't. You're just exaggerating. Well, I hope I never try to give away my father's secret work. I wasn't trying to. Mr Wu's all right. Why should you think he isn't? I don't like him and I don't trust him. But there you sat, lapping up everything he said, ready to pour out all he wanted to know. I'm ashamed of you. You'd get a jolly good scolding if your father had heard you. I only hope you haven't already said too much. You know how angry your father was when a report of his latest ideas got into the papers and swarms of people came prying round the house. It's not fair. I'm going home. Let him go, the little idiot. Come into one of the tents and have a powwow before we get undressed and go to sleep. I'm sorry poor old Tinker isn't going to camp out with us. Our first night in the field. I don't think he meant to give anything away. That's no excuse, Anne. He can be really stupid at times, and he's got to learn not to be. Let's go to our tent. I feel quite tired. Come along, Timmy. Oh. <sighs> Awfully catching this yawning business. Well, it's turned out to be a lovely night as regards weather. Warm and dry, and there's a nice little half moon to look at. Good night, girls. Sleep tight. And don't scream if a spider wakes you, because I warn you, I'm not going to get up to deal with a harmless spider. You wait till one runs over your face and starts making a web from your nose to your chin and catches flies in it. Don't, Anne. I'm not a bit scared of spiders, but that's a horrible idea of yours. Timmy, please watch out for spiders. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, girls. Pity about young Tinker. Still, he's got to learn a few things, and keeping his mouth shut is one of them. They were all quite tired, and it wasn't long before everyone's torch was out, and peace and quiet descended on the little camp. Much farther up the field, the circus was also peaceful and quiet, though there were still lights here and there in the tents. Nobody heard someone stirring in the circus camp. Nobody saw a shadowy figure creep out when the moon was safely behind a cloud. It was late, very late, and the two camps were lost in dreams. What a shock for poor Professor Hayling next morning, when he crossed the courtyard, unlocked the bottom door of the tower, walked up the spiral stairway, unlocked the middle door, and went on up the stairway again, and finally unlocked the top door and opened it wide. He stood and stared in horror. The place was upside down. All his papers were scattered everywhere. He crouched down at once to see if any were missing. Yes, quite a lot. But they seemed to have been taken quite haphazardly. A few pages from this notebook, a few from that. And good gracious, ink was spilt all over the place. And the little clock was gone from the mantelpiece. And the thief could apparently get through three locked doors. Or else he could climb up a long, long ladder that he'd put outside without being seen and taken away again. Tinker was horrified when Jenny told him the next morning what had happened. How awful. 
Dad kept his most precious papers there with all the figures for that new electrical thing of his. It's a wonderful thing. Too marvellous for words, Jenny. It's for... Now, don't you give away any of your father's plans. Not even to me. You've been told that before. Maybe you've been talking too much already. And somebody's ears took it all in. But I... Your father says they must have used a ladder. But nobody could have brought a long ladder into that courtyard. Not without us seeing it anyway. Or hearing some kind of noise when it was dragged in. But it might have been a sliding ladder, mightn't it? That would be a smallish thing. Like the window cleaner uses, you mean? It couldn't have been the window cleaner, could it? No, he's a really decent fellow. I've known him for 20 years, so put that out of your mind. But the latter could certainly have been the sort that window cleaners use. We'll go out into the courtyard as soon as I've finished washing up and see if we can find the marks where the ladder was dragged over the courtyard. You'd better go to your father, Tinker. You might be able to comfort him a little. He's very upset indeed. He's up in the tower room, trying to sort out his papers. My word, they were left in a state, scattered all over the room. Tinker stood up to go, and was astonished to find that he was shaky at the knees. Would his father ask him if he'd been talking about the work he was doing? Oh dear, he had even boasted about it just the day before, and talking about his father's scow wheel and the wonderful new machine, the electric trosimon. Tinker's knees became shakier than ever. But fortunately, his father was far too upset about his muddled room and missing papers to worry about anything Tinker had said or done. He was up in the tower room, trying to discover which papers were missing. Ah, oh, Tinker, just give me a hand, will you? The thief who came last night must have knocked the whole bunch of papers off the table down on the floor. And fortunately, he seems not to have seen some that went under the table. He didn't get them all, then. No, thank goodness. And I doubt very much if the papers he did take away with him will be of any use. He'd need to be quite a scientist to understand them without having the ones he left behind. Will he come back for the others, then? Probably. But I shall hide them somewhere. Can you think of a good hiding place, Tinker? Dad, don't you hide them. Not unless you tell me where they are. You know how you forget things. You might forget where you put this bunch of papers... And then you wouldn't be able to go on with your inventions. Have you copies of the stolen sheets of figures and diagrams? No, but they're all in my head as well as on paper. It will take me a bit of time to work them all out again, but it can be done. It's a nuisance, especially as I'm working to a date. Now run along, Tinker, please. I've work to do. Tinker went down the spiral staircase of the tower. He'd have to make sure that his father did hide away those papers very carefully indeed, in some really good place. Oh dear, I hope he won't do what he did with the last lot of papers he wanted to hide, he thought. He stuffed them up the chimney, and they nearly went up in flames because Jenny thought she'd light the fire the next night, it was so unexpectedly cold. Good thing they fell down when she laid the fire and she rescued them before they got burnt. Why are brainy people like Dad so silly about ordinary things? I bet he'll either forget where he puts them, or goes and hides them in some easy place where anyone could find them. Tinker decided to talk to Jenny about it. Jenny, Dad says the thief took only some of his papers and that he can't make much use of the ones he took unless he has the whole lot. And Dad thinks when the thief finds out, he'll try and steal the rest of the papers. Well, let him try. I could hide them in a place where no thief would find them if your dad would let me have them. I shan't tell you where. I'm afraid he might hide them up a chimney again, or some silly place like that. They've got to be hidden somewhere nobody will think of looking. And if Dad finds a place like that, he'll promptly forget all about it, and never be able to find them again. But a thief might find them, he'd know all the places to look in. Well, let's go up to the tower room and clear up the mess that the spilt ink has made, and see if your father has taken his precious papers and hidden them somewhere there. It would be just like him to hide them in the very room that the thief went to last night. Up the ladder, in the window, left wide open, no doubt, snatched up every paper he could see, the rogue, and then raced down the ladder again. Come on up the tower, then. I only hope Dad isn't still there. No, he's just crossing the courtyard. See? There he is, carrying something under his arm. The morning newspapers. It looks as if he's going to have a jolly good read, doesn't it? 
Oh dear, I do hope this won't be all printed in the newspapers. It would bring hordes of people down here again. Do you remember how awful it was last time, Jenny? People even walked all over the flower beds. Oh, some people like to poke their noses into everything. I don't mind telling you that I emptied my dirty washing water out of the window onto a few of them. Quite by mistake, of course. How was I to know they were out there staring up and down? <laughs> <laughs> I'd seen that. Oh, Jenny, if people come poking their noses into Dad's business again, do let's empty some water on their silly heads. Come on, Jenny. Let's go up to the tower room now. Dad's out of the way. Quick! They were soon out in the courtyard, and as they crossed it, Jenny stopped and looked hard at the ground to see if there were any marks that might have been made by someone dragging a ladder across. The two of them looked all over the courtyard, but couldn't see anything unusual. Jenny looked up at the tall, steep wall of the tower. It was made of flintstones of all shapes and sizes, the kind found in the countryside round about Kirin and Big Hollow. Well, I suppose a cat might climb up, but not a man. He'd slip sooner or later. It would be far too dangerous. I doubt even a cat would get far. And can you imagine anyone climbing up it at night, when it was dark? No, you're right. Only a madman would try. Exactly. But I don't think there was a ladder either. There would be marks on the paving stones in the courtyard if there had been a ladder. Oh, well, let's hurry on up to the tower room before your dad decides to go back to it again. They went up the spiral stairway. All the doors were unlocked, as it was plain that the professor was going to come back after he'd read his papers. All the same, he shouldn't leave the doors unlocked, even for a minute. Oh, well, here we are. Oh, just look at the ink splashes everywhere. And that dear little clock that kept such good time is gone too. Now, what would the thief want with a clock, I'd like to know? It would be small and neat enough to pop into his pocket. If he was dishonest enough to steal Dad's papers, he certainly would not say no to a nice little clock like that. He's probably taken other things, too. You're probably right, Tinker. Why? What is it? Would you just look at that? Aren't those some of the papers your father was working on? On the table there? All covered with tiny figures? Yes, I think you're right. They're his very latest papers. He showed them to me the other day. I remember this diagram here, Jenny. How could he leave them on the table with the door unlocked when only last night the thief was here? Don't ask me. How could he? He said he was going to hide them away so carefully because if the thief found them, he could use them with the other papers that were stolen. But as long as the thief only had half of them, they wouldn't be much use. And now he's forgotten all about hiding them. Look now, Tinker. Let's hide them away ourselves and not tell him where they are. Those thieves will have another try for them, no doubt about that. Let's think of some place where they'd be absolutely safe. I know. We could hide them on Kieran Island. Somewhere in the old ruined castle. Nobody would guess they were there. Now that's a fine idea. I'd be glad to think they were out of the house. Now, here you are. Take all these papers. You'd better tell Julian and the others and go across to the island with them as soon as you can. Oh, my... What a relief to think they'll be well away from here. I'll be able to sleep soundly in my bed at night then. Tinker stuffed the precious papers under his jersey and he and Jenny ran at top speed down the spiral stairway. Then Tinker went down to the camp in the field to tell the others all that had happened that morning. He still felt angry about being ticked off by Julian the night before but he simply couldn't wait to tell the others about the robbery and about the grand idea he, Tinker, had of hiding the rest of the papers on Kirin Island. So off he went with mischief happily on his shoulder, holding tightly to his hair. The others were all there in the field. They'd just come back from a shopping expedition. Julian was glad to see that Tinker looked bright and cheerful. He was afraid that the boy might have sulked and that would have spoiled things for the others. Tinker proceeded to tell the others about the happenings of the night before and his idea about where he could hide his father's papers. 
And where is this wonderful hiding place? On Kieran Island. Who'd think of looking there? And as we all know the hiding place, we can't possibly forget it. I'll tell Dad that the papers are absolutely safe and he can get on with the rest of his ideas without worrying about anything. You haven't told him all this yet, then? Well, n no. Jenny thought we should hide them first. She's pretty certain that the thieves will try their hand at breaking in to get the rest of the papers, you see. Ha! Well, I vote we scribble some papers ourselves, complete with wonderful diagrams and all kinds of peculiar figurings and numberings. I could do that, and we'd leave them up in the tower room for the thieves to take. They'd think they were the ones they missed. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Leave them with fake figures and hide the papers with the genuine figures on Kieran Island. When shall we go? It's ages since I visited my island. Dick and Julian had better make the fake papers. They'd be better at that than anyone else. And Tinker can plant them somewhere in his father's tower room for the thief to take if he goes there again. And I bet he will. He found it easy enough last night. And George could take Tinker's father's papers with the correct figures and plans over to Kieran Island. Not till night time, though. If anyone was still on watch and saw George rowing over there, they might guess she was taking something important to hide. They might be watching her father, too. By the way, where are the papers? You didn't leave them behind at home, did you, Tinker? I didn't dare to. I felt as if there might be eyes peeping at me, watching, hoping I'd go out and leave the papers behind. I've got them under my jersey here, just here. Oh, so that's why you look as if you've had too much breakfast. Well, what shall our plans be? We'd better make out the fool's papers straight away, with figures and diagrams, just in case the thieves come sooner than we think. Tinker, we'd better go into your house to do those. My father might not be too keen to have us around, though, because he's so busy with his new invention. It's awfully good, and... Tinker, don't start spilling beans again. I say it would be best to go to your house. What about me going indoors and bringing out Dad's big drawing board and some of his paper? We could do the diagrams and things out here in the tent. Honestly, I never know when Dad's going to come into my room. He would wonder what on earth we were all doing if he found us all there. We could have a good look at the papers under my jersey and do the whole lot in the same style. Not the same figures, naturally. And we could do some diagrams, too. All right. Go and get the drawing board and come back with it and anything else we might need. You go with him, George. Tinker and George went back up to the house and found a large drawing board, some big sheets of paper used by his father for working out figures, and a book of odd but easy-to-copy diagrams. He also brought mapping pens, Indian ink and blotting paper. George carried half the things and kept a sharp lookout for Tinker's father. They all then went into the boy's tent, which was the bigger one. Timmy too, and Mischief, who was delighted to be with the big dog. Julian soon set to work, though he found the space rather cramped. They were all watching him as he set out rows of meaningless figures, when Timmy suddenly gave a deep growl and all his hackles rose on his neck. Julian turned the drawing board over at once and sat on it. The canvas doorway of the tent was pulled aside and in poked the grinning face of Charlie the Chimp. Oh, it's you, Charlie. Well, well, well. And how are you today? Sit down, Charlie. I suppose you've let yourself out of your cage as usual and you've come to see what we've got for our dinner. Well, you'll be glad to hear we've got enough for you as well as ourselves. But there's something I must finish first, Charlie. I bet that chimp could draw if you gave him a piece of paper and a pencil. That's an idea. Here, Charlie, something to keep you quiet. Goodness, he's doing a whole lot of funny figures. He's trying to copy you, Jew. If he's not careful, I'll hand the whole job over to him. <coughs> He'd like that. We'd better talk about your plans for tonight, George. I think if you're going over to Kieran Island to hide those papers, you must take Timmy with you. Oh, I will. Not that there will be a single soul on the island, but I'd like Tim just for company. I'll take the papers straight to the island and hide them. Where? Oh, I'll decide when I'm there. Somewhere cunning. I know my own little island from top to bottom. And there those papers will stay until all danger has passed. It'll be fun to row across to my own little island at night with Timmy. 
The thieves can make do with my figures and diagrams if they come to the tower room again. Don't they look professional? They certainly did. Everyone looked at the neat figures and carefully drawn diagrams with admiration. Timmy suddenly sat up and gave a deep growl again. Charlie the Chimp patted him as if to say, What's wrong, old boy? But Timmy took no notice and kept on growling. Suddenly he shot out of the tent and there was a shout from someone outside. <coughs> Get off! Get alone! Down! <coughs> what is it, Timmy? <coughs> Mr. Wu! Oh, Charlie! Charlie! <coughs> oh, I trust I have not to disturb you, my friends. I'll take a little walk with my friend Charlie. You come again to see our show, I hope, yes? No? Uh, probably. I interrupt you? Oh, pardon me. Well, we will go. Come, Charlie. We didn't realise that anyone from the circus would walk down the field so quietly and be able to hear what we were saying inside the tent. And I didn't like the look in his eyes. Dick, you don't suppose he heard anything we were saying, do you? Would it matter? It might. Do you think he heard what George said about going over to Kieran Island with the other papers, the valuable ones that the thieves didn't see in the tower room last night? I wouldn't let George go if I thought he'd heard. In fact, I think she'd better not go. She might run into danger. Don't be silly, Jew. I am going. And Timmy will be with me. You heard what I said, George. You are not to go. I'll take the papers and hide them on the island. I'll get them when it's dark, fairly late. All right, Julian. Shall we have a meal now? We've only got to open the tins, and the drinks are in that cool corner over there. Oh, yes, I suppose so. You know, I somehow feel all my work here isn't much good now. I think Mr Wu must have guessed it was all made up as soon as he saw it. He gave himself away a bit, though. I saw him looking at the paper in a rather startled way, as if he'd seen something like it very recently indeed. So he would have done if he'd sent someone up to get my dad's papers out of the tower room. Hey, what about having a look around the circus to see if we can spot a ladder anywhere? One tall enough to reach the tower room. Good idea. Come on, we'll go now. Chuck that drawing board and diagram paper over the fence, Jew. I hardly think it's worth your while finishing it. The five, with Tinker and Mischief, wandered down the field to where the circus was encamped. Dick spotted a ladder lying in the grass and nudged Julian. Julian, see that? Would it reach the tower? It's certainly very long, but is it long enough? I don't think so. I know. What about the acrobats? They must be used to climbing and clambering everywhere. I wonder if any of them could have climbed the wall. I don't think so. I had a good look at it this morning. There was a kind of creeper climbing up the wall, but it stops halfway. And above that, there's just a stone wall. Even an acrobat would have to have some help climbing up the tower wall. Could the clowns have found a way then? No, I suppose they're not as good even as the acrobats at climbing. I don't believe the thief could have been anyone from the circus at all. Hey, where's Mischief off to now, Tinker? No idea. He must think it's dinner time. And so it is. Come on, everybody. Jenny will be in a fine old fury if we're really late. Away they went in a hurry, over the fence at top speed. They mustn't keep dinner waiting. Or Jenny either. The talk at dinner time was very lively, and so was Mischief the monkey. He took bits from everyone's plate and handed some of them down to Timmy. Well, I didn't see a single ladder in the circus camp that was long enough. No. If there was one, it was jolly well hidden. Pass the mustard, someone. It's in front of you. You know, I'm beginning to wonder if Mr Wu has anything to do with the stealing of your father's papers, Tinker. I can't see him climbing ladders. He's so... so... Polite and proper. Mm. Actually, I can't think of anyone in the circus who would either want the papers or is nasty enough to steal them. I still think Mr Wu is the most likely one. He's interested in complicated figures and clever inventions. But all the same, I'm beginning to think I'm wrong. He couldn't have got up to the tower room as there's no ladder long enough. And even if there was, I doubt he'd risk putting it up the tower. He might so easily be caught. Right. We'll rule him out. But if nobody went up the spiral staircase because all the doors were locked, and nobody used the ladder, I don't see how those papers disappeared. Wind took them out of the window, perhaps? No. The window wasn't wide enough open. And if the wind had blown them out, we'd have been sure to have found some of them down in the courtyard. 
Well, if nobody got through the three locked doors and nobody came through the window, how did the papers get stolen? I suppose Tinker's father couldn't possibly have gone walking in his sleep and taken them, could he? Have you ever known your father to walk in his sleep, Tinker? No, can't say I have. It must have been a miracle, man, then. No ordinary person could have done it. And if he wanted them so very badly, he'd certainly make an effort to get the ones he left behind. Good thing we've got those. Well, those papers will be safely out of his way tonight. On my island. Yes, I'll find a most unlikely hiding place. By the way, I hope you still haven't got them under your jersey, Tinker. No, George said I'd better give them to her to keep. Well, I'll go down to Kirin Village as soon as it's dark. I suppose your boat is tied up in the usual place, George. You can give me the papers just before I leave. But when Julian went to George's tent that evening, George had gone. And Timmy too. He was furious and went up to the house with Dick and Tinker to tell Jenny about George. Then he and Dick went off in search of George. By this time, George was already by the stretch of beach where boats were kept. She stared out to sea at Kirin Island and clutched at Timmy's collar in surprise. Timmy, there's a light on my island. Look, can you see it? How dare they? It's my island. No, Timmy, I'm not going back until I've found out who's there. And if it's somebody waiting for me to turn up with the papers, they can think again. I'll hide them under the tarpaulin of this boat. George stuffed the parcel of papers under the tarpaulin as she spoke. Then she set off for Kirin Island. It wasn't long before she rowed into the little creek that ran a little way inland and tied the mooring rope round the trunk of the nearest tree. She found the other boat a little way off, lying on the sands, its rope around a nearby rock. The tide was almost up to it, so she untied the rope and gave the boat a push. In ten minutes the tide would be right under it and the boat would float away. George began to make her way up the beach, Timmy by her side. They silently arrived at the middle of the little island where there was an old ruined castle. And in the middle of the courtyard of the castle were two men playing cards by the light of a powerful lantern. Timmy couldn't help giving a surprised growl when he saw one of them, but George hushed him at once. Mr. Wu, the magician, was there dealing out the cards. The other man she didn't know. He was well-dressed and seemed bored. He flung down his cards as Timmy and George watched and spoke in an irritated voice. Well, whoever it is you said was bringing the rest of those papers here to this island doesn't seem to be turning up. The papers you've given me are good, very good, but no use without the others. I must have the complete set of papers. Or well, there will be no money for you. I tell you, someone will be here with them. I heard them say so. Who stole them? You? No. I did not steal them. Me, I keep my hands clean. No. You let other people do your dirty work for you, don't you? Mr. Wu, the world's most wonderful magician, does not soil his hands. How did you manage to get the papers? By using my eyes and my ears and my cunning, my good friend. I'm not your good friend. I've got business with you, but I wouldn't want you for a friend. I'd rather have that chimpanzee of yours. Now, why doesn't this fellow come? Timmy, I'm going to tell them to clear off my island. Don't come with me. Wait till I call you. Then if you have to rescue me, come at once. Hey, you two. What are you doing on my island? Oh, it's you. So the boys sent you to hide the papers instead of daring to come themselves, did they? I've already hidden the papers. Somewhere you won't find them. Now just you clear off, both of you. A very brave and a determined young lady. Do you mean to tell me that's a girl? Well, she's a plucky kid. Now look here. If you've got those papers, I'll give you a whole lot of money. Come and get them then. But either the way. I'll just get my dog to come with us. Oh. Timmy. 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 George led them to the shore, to the place where they had left their boat. But their boat was no longer there. George led them up a steep bank to look for it, and then gave them the surprise of their lives. 
she ran at Mr. Wu and gave him such a push that he fell right over the high bank into the sea below. Timmy did the same to the other man, leaping at him and pushing him too into the sea. While they were struggling, she climbed into her own boat and rowed back to shore, with Timmy standing in the prow of the boat. As she approached the mainland, she saw a light which she took to be a fisherman. But it wasn't a fisherman. It was Julian and Dick. George, you wicked girl. I said you weren't to go to the island. You might have found the thieves there, and then you'd have been in trouble. I did find them, but it's they who are in trouble, not me. It was Mr. Wu and another man. They asked me for the papers. Oh, George, you didn't give them to the men. Of course not. I've already hidden them somewhere where they won't find them. And I've set their boat free so they can't leave Kiran Island. I'm beginning to think it was a good thing you went to the island instead of me. But what on earth will the police say when we tell them? Let's let the men kick their heels on the island all night. And we'll decide what to do about the police in the morning. Oh, it's funny. I suddenly feel awfully tired. I bet you do. Come on, let's get back. Oh, and those precious papers. Where are they? Under a tarpaulin in that boat down there. I'll get them. Then off we go back to Big Hollow House. The others will be getting awfully worried by now. At last they were back at the tents, and the others crowded round to hear what had happened. Afterwards, George was glad to flop down on her rugs. She fell asleep at once. But Julian and Dick didn't. They lay awake for some time, chuckling over George's deeds of daring. What a cousin to have! When they were at the house next morning, Jeremy came up the garden and put his head through the dining room window to say that Mr. Wu wasn't in his tent and Charlie was too miserable for words. Julian was just about to say he knew exactly where Mr. Wu was when Tinker rushed off with Jeremy. He was very fond of Charlie. Let's get into the cage with him. He'll like to be comforted. He must be missing Mr. Wu very much. Jeremy, there you are. And Tinker. I don't know what's happened to Mr. Wu. He didn't come home at all last night. But I can't spare you to cry over Charlie all morning. He'll soon perk up. Uh, you can stay with him if you like, Tinker. Thank you, Mr. Tapper. Come along then, Jeremy. Poor old thing. You do look so sad, Charlie. What's that funny noise, Charlie? It sounds like a watch or something. Perhaps Mr. Wu's big gold watch has fallen into your cage. Where is it? I can hear it clearly now. Is it under the straw? Here it is. Charlie. Charlie, where did you get that little clock? It's Dad's from the towel room. Tinker slid out of the cage and went back over the fence and into his own garden. Up the path he ran and burst into the living room where the others were finishing their breakfast. Julian, Dick. What's up? I know who the thief was who climbed in at the tower window. Who? Charlie the chimp. Why didn't we think of it before? He can climb anything. Gosh, I bet old Charlie's been taught to get into all sorts of windows and take whatever he sees. Of course, and Mr. Woon must have known your father worked in the tower. Wu could easily teach him to take papers, but he wouldn't be able to carry them all. He must have crammed them in his mouth so he could climb down. That's why some were left. But wait a bit, Tinker. How on earth do you know it was him? Nobody saw him. It was night. Well, I do know it was Charlie. You remember that dear little clock on the tower and mantelpiece that disappeared the night of the robbery? Well, I found it in his cage. I heard it ticking. So when Charlie handed over the papers to Mr. Wu, he was crafty enough to keep his own little toy. Exactly. I think it's time we got the police along to catch Mr. Wu and his friend. Goodness knows what else he has taught Charlie to steal. I bet he sent that chimp into a lot of houses. There's probably been a trail of robberies wherever the circus went. But if Mr. Wu goes to prison, who'll look after Charlie? I bet Jeremy will take care of him. He adores him. <sighs> so that's another adventure over. I'm glad you solved the mystery, Tinker. And what an exciting time we've had. I really did enjoy every minute of it. <coughs> so did we, George. Hurry up and fall into another adventure. We're longing to hear what you and the others will be up to next. Goodbye for now. 
and take care of yourselves, famous five. Good luck.